the power of seizing your attention coming up right after this. During my years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore and create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home, a show about design and blurring the lines between inside and out. Now, in today's show, we're going to pick up with my principles of design. There are 12 of them. Today, we're going to focus on number five, which is focal points. And here's a great example of it. Here in this rondelle, surrounded by these emerald giant arbovita, we have a 19th century urn with a variegated agave americana in the center, or a century plant and it's a focal point that captures your eye. Throughout the show, we're gonna be talking about how to arrest the eye and capture your attention in the gardens. As a matter of fact, you can see this is floating on a cloud of coleus. Again, the idea is to capture your attention or your eye. Now, not only are we going to be looking at various examples throughout the Garden Home Retreat outside, we're also gonna take a look inside and see the importance of focal point. So why don't we get started by checking in with the house and see where we are with construction. The entry all here to the house has really changed. You know, I can remember back when it was just nothing but, well, studs. And this staircase, well, it was just roughed in. But now all the refined details are here. We did the plaster curves, which I think really adds so much to this space. We have a curve here at the top of the staircase, and at the bottom under the staircase, there's another curve. And these are really the only two curves in the entire house. What I love about this space are the proportions and the scale of it. And what helps tie it together is really color. We have the white trim. We have this beautiful Nantucket breeze wall color, which is a soft green. But then there's a lot of brown in here. You look at the sisal rugs I've used on the floor. I have two rugs, one runner down the hall and one up the staircase. And that's banded in a chocolate brown, which reflects the furniture and what I consider a piece of furniture, this handrail. It's walnut. And after several layers of loving finish, we got this gorgeous shine and color and all resonates so well. Now, one of the focal points here in the entry hall that you see as soon as you come in the front door are these portraits that are stacked at the top of the stairwell. Now, these are reproductions that came out of a three-set folio or three-set volume. It's called The History of the Indian Tribes of America. You see, they were published by McKinney and Hall. And there were these three different sets that came out at different times. The first, 1832, then 1835 for the second one, then the last one was 1844. Sadly, most of them burned in a fire in the Smithsonian that occurred in 1865. And these are just a reminder of the Native American presence that was here in this part of the world before white settlers came. We had Caddo's, we had Osage, and we had the Quapaw. And the river just beyond that Thomas Nottall came down in 1819 when we first became a territory, that was part of the Trail of Tears. Well, of course, that's a very sad chapter of American history and we can deal with that on another show. But I have to tell you that I'm really excited about this coming together. It's all natural. We've used the sisal, we've used pine that's local, and we've used this beautiful uh, locally milled walnut. So that feels really good, but there's still a lot of details that haven't been covered yet, but we're getting there. We're just about to finish up the hall. Hey, there's running water. That's an improvement. Despite the fact that we still have some bits and pieces of plumbing accoutrement lying about, we're moving ahead. This room is almost finished. It's the master bathroom. Now, I have to say that early on in the planning phase of the garden home retreat, the conversation turned to gray water. Now, gray water is simply defined as any of the water that comes out of the house except for what comes out of the toilets. 
You see, this would be water that will come from the shower, sink, laundry, dishwashers, and it comprises between 50 and 80% of residential wastewater. That's a lot of water. We've learned that this water can be used for other purposes, such as landscape irrigation. You see, if gray water is collected using a separate plumbing system, it can be recycled within the home and be immediately reused or processed and stored. You see, recycled gray water is not clean enough to drink, but it does go through a series of stages of filtration and can provide water for your garden. Now, what we use it for here at the Garden Home Retreat is to water the orchard. Now think about it, the water that comes through the sink and the bathtub here, in the past, well, it would have just gone right into the septic. But with this system, we water the orchard and we're converting this water into fresh, gorgeous, delicious, and juicy apples. Now that's a green idea. If you look at a plan of the property, you can tell it's very axial. And there are two focal points that work hand in hand with one another. In the front, you can see the big oak tree. And you can look through the middle window, through the middle back French doors, and look straight through the center of a round pool and beyond to the river. And actually, the orchard creates a sense of directing the eye toward the focal point, which is the river. Now, in the middle ground is the pool which really the eye does go to first. And in the summer, it really, I think, is the most spectacular. Well, besides the spring, because in the spring we have pots full of tulips, just so abundant, it's hard to believe. But then as the season unfolds, roses begin to bloom. I have three different types of old-fashioned roses in that circle. And then by midsummer and well into late summer, we have the vitex in full bloom, which is really glorious. It almost matches the color of the sky, the blooms that is. And then the agapanthus or lily of the Nile that surround the pool bloom until late summer and there's nothing better than that color of blue. And from this vantage point, which is the porch, it's a great place to spend time during those hot, long dog days of summer. This porch is a great example of blurring the lines between inside and out. It really is a room that is outdoors. <music> Certainly this simple round water feature serves as a focal point in the garden. Now when I created this garden, I never realized that I would enjoy these steps so much. You know, a terraced garden, well, it has its challenges. You have to get from one level to the next. But these steps have actually come in very handy for a number of reasons. First, I love to stack pots and put some of my favorite plants along here so I could watch every day. The other thing that's so great is it just gives you a generous access into the garden. This is where we come and go regularly. And I've also found it's a great entertainment space. It serves as an outdoor amphitheater or a stage. Cliff Baker, director of Wildwood Performing Arts Park, sees the benefit of using nature and the garden as a place for the performing arts. The exciting thing about Wildwood is that in rethinking how different kinds of arts can interrelate, and by that I mean gardening arts as well as performing arts, we found that Wildwood has become a perfect setting to showcase the really premier arts that already exist in our region. But what's exciting is to involve performing arts, visual arts, culinary arts, all of that in the building of festivals and fairs and uh, experiences for audiences so that they get a taste of a lot of different kinds of things in one trip to the park. And it, it really does have something that feeds the interest of everybody. I mean, as you walk through the designated named gardens throughout the park, as well as some of the expansive areas like the Arboretum, you'll find pads, for example, where we can set up vendors or small performance troops. There's a, a hill behind us in the woods that is called Butler's Hill that holds our children's area. So uh, there's lots of different ways to involve the property in these different experiences we're talking about. For some events, for example, we put opera singers or uh, small classical groups in the stone gazebo at the end of the lake. The idea of how you would tie all of the arts together is for us, I think, best realized by developing a festival format. And that's where the park is moving to. There is nothing new about festival formats. They've been going on all over the world for centuries. 
but this is something that we're trying here and finding it works, that people engage in it and love it. And there are just lots of spaces within the park that are suitable for different kinds of involvements with, from people. As director of the park, it's exciting just to see people come out, know that Wildwood Park is alive and well and want to be a part of this beautiful setting and they come out and re they read a book or they walk their dog or they take a morning jog. And that's exciting because that, I think there you're really starting to touch people. Let's see if this is going to be deep enough. We're getting there. You know, when I plant a tomato, I really want to plant almost 80% of the stalk, and these have gotten rather tall. These are actually an heirloom variety called Charlie's Radiator Shop Mortgage Lifter. What I love about some of these heirloom tomatoes is that they have such interesting stories behind them. For instance, in this case, Charlie had a radiator shop, and he sold uh, seeds and he sold plants and he sold tomatoes in the summer from his tomato garden that was next to his radiator shop and he did so well with his tomatoes he was able to retire the mortgage on the property now it's a delicious tomato and very productive like some of the modern hybrids and in this space which is eight by eight I probably won't be able to grow more than six or nine plants but I wanted to focus just a moment on the idea of raising a few things in these raised bed systems. And if you don't want to grow a garden as large as the one you see behind me, you can certainly take the raised bed approach. And what I've done is created three of these eight by eight beds. And I have the three different beds because of crop rotation. It's really beneficial to rotate your crops. Let me give you an example. In this bed, I'm gonna plant members of the tomato family. That would include peppers and eggplants. In the next bed, I'm going to plant members of the cabbage family, which would include Brussels sprouts and broccoli. And in the third bed, I'm going to plant members of the melon family, which would include squashes and cucumbers and so forth. And then next year, I'll rotate it around. So the problems, the pests, the pathogens that affect tomatoes don't build up in the soil and cause you to have problems down the road. You stay a step ahead of these pests. So think about the raised bed concept. These are two by 10 pieces of cypress. I like cypress redwood or one of the cedars. And they're just simply attached at the corners using some wood screws that will hold them in place along with some stakes. I've amended it with lots of soil. The soil falls apart in my hand easily and I'm expecting a bumper crop in these three small beds. It just doesn't stop there. In the fall, I'll sow some spinach as well as plant some more broccoli and I'll have that right up until cold weather. Then in the spring, I'll fill these beds with lettuce, all kinds of spring greens such as arugula. So as you can see, with some full sun and a desire to grow some of your own vegetables, you can really produce a lot of groceries. <music> I have to say, I have to always watch myself when I'm creating a centerpiece for my dining table. I have to remember that there are two reasons for doing it. One is for just creating something beautiful for the table, but the main reason is to create something that doesn't block the view of my guest from across the table. Try to talk across the table when you have a big centerpiece in the way. It's just downright annoying. Try elevating your centerpiece. A special piece of silver from my collection helps me do just that. Throughout the year, I enjoy using this early 19th century Irish silver apern in my dining room. The bowl at the top just invites bounty without overpowering the setting. Here I filled it with wild and domestic pears. The small votive candles encircling the base create a warm glow that dances off the silver. Surrounding the apern are several clipped boxwoods planted in silver mint julep cups, creating the feel of a French parterre garden. Now, as you can see, there's no leaning over to the next guest to see around the centerpiece. It's perfect.
Okay, so why don't we load up and have a little fun and go someplace where we can see some of our little feathered friends like this guy on exhibition. We can chat with my friend Tracy Hill about these little beauties, and he just so happens to be the judge at this particular poultry show. Hey, Tracy. Yes, sir. How's it going? Just fine, how are you? Good to see you again. What do you think of the show? Oh, it's great. Well, it's, um, it's always exciting for me to come here and see all these, all these birds, and this year I think we've got a good, good show. Oh, yeah, it's, uh, I judged here a year ago, and uh, I think they had just a little over 500 birds, and this year they've got like 100 more than they did That's a year excellent. ago. Yeah, That's it's really excellent. A, how many different breeds of chickens are there? Every year there's somebody that comes up with a new color pattern or something. I think there's like over 600 breeds of chicken, bantams anyway. And if you were going to suggest a, a breed for say a, a youngster to start with, what would they be? I would probably recommend a new person to raise a solid color chicken, uh, like a white Plymouth Rock, white Cochin, white Leghorn, yeah. uh, black type chicken, yeah. and then maybe get into something a little tougher where you got multicolors and stuff. So in the judging process, the feather patterns become uh, more challenging to get right. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so the solid the solid birds uh, always show well or would be good for Well, you have one less uh, thing to worry about, you know, is on the color pattern. Right. Are there breeds that are, are calmer or gentler than others? Yes, uh, you got like modern game. Uh, They'll just, you just open the door and they'll come to you. Black Old English, White Old English are real gentle chicken. Sure, and of course some of the feather-legged varieties are pretty gentle. Yeah, I think they're, you know, they're just so heavy and short they can't go very far anyway. <laughs> what is it you enjoy the most about coming to a poultry show and judging it? I would say the people. Yeah. You know, this uh, everywhere you go, the people are great. Real, real down there, people, yeah. you know. It's a, it's a great group of people, I think, for families to be involved with. Yes, it is. Yeah, very family-oriented hobby. Yes, it's, it's a great hobby. Uh, these young people out there that want something that don't cost a lot of money, like a cow or a pig or a horse. Uh, or a motorcycle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get them a few chickens. That's it. You know, you can feed a lot of chickens and and have a lot of fun with it. Sure you can. For cheap price. Yeah, very good. Well, thanks for talking to me. You bet, I yeah. enjoyed it. Well, now we've come to that place in the show where we take images from you, pictures you've sent to me of your home and garden. We play around with some ideas on how to improve the landscape. Today, we have a picture from Kim in Missouri. Now what we have here is a charming cottage. Now Kim, I'll tell you, if it were mine, what I would do, I would go with a classic white theme here. So why don't we get started with just a few ideas. First of all, it looks as though um, this is a very tight staircase coming up, all right? That's fine, let's leave that. But what if we created some sort of flagstone with just natural flat stone that could go here to create a generous entrance. Now I don't know what's coming around here if there's a path or not or on this side. You see you could connect this quite easily around where you would come to this flagstone area. Then you've defined a bed space here and a bed space here. Okay now let's talk about some plants. You said this is north facing so we've got to think really cool plants. Plants that like that kind of temperature um, hydrangeas would be fantastic, but I think we need some evergreens. An evergreen that can take some shade would be a yew. I would tend to punctuate the ends maybe with something like that, a yew or a hemlock, maybe a yew here. I think we definitely need to screen the AC unit here. So I would even bring some yews around. You can pull them out into the bed like this. That serves as a backdrop for some deciduous shrubs. And think about just piling in white hydrangeas all across here, all in here, like Annabelle's, would be just gorgeous. And then maybe on this end here, we might even come in with a Yoshino cherry, something to anchor this in. Not a very large tree, it could also be a white dogwood. So you see where I'm going with this. Okay, there's your shrubs in place and a tree. Now let's talk just a minute about maybe some perennials and annuals. So this bed, the entire underside of it could be planted in hostas and ferns. And same way over here, I'd like for you to explore using some of the little white impatience. Each little flower 
looks like a rose. And then also some hookara has a very chartreuse leaf which can bring a lot of interest to a shady area. So I think creating this envelope or this arm around a central pad here of stone where you could place some containers around and create a greater sense of entry, echoing the color white that you have here on the trim is a way to get started. Good luck with your project there, Kim. Temperatures out here have begun to cool down just a bit. It's fall, it's all natural, but it doesn't mean that I have to stop gardening. In fact, this is a great time of the year to do some fall vegetable gardening. I love to plant what is called the cruciferous vegetables. Vegetables like cabbage and broccoli and cauliflower and Brussels sprouts and collards and kale. They're mighty good for you. And this is a great time of year because they love cool weather. Now, not hard, hard freezing weather. I'm talking about they can take into the low 30s, maybe 28 or something like that. And if you use a frost blanket on them, you can bring them through, well, even colder temperatures than that. What I like to do is plant my broccoli this late in the season from plants like this. A little earlier in the season, say 30 to 45 days ago, I could have planted them from seed. But now I'm gonna start with plants. And within about 30 days, I'll be harvesting some of this broccoli. I love broccoli because, well, it's just so satisfying to grow. It's so beautiful in the garden. I plant them about 18 inches to, well, maybe 16 inches apart. And the rows are about 30 inches apart. So in these beds, you can see I can pack in a lot of broccoli. So you may be saying, so if you have all of this stuff that comes in or it's time to harvest all at one time, what are you gonna do with it all? Well, I'll eat all I can eat. Hey, I may throw a broccoli party, but what I'll really do is go through, harvest it, blanch it lightly, put it in freezer bags, pop it in the freezer, and I'll have broccoli to eat all winter long. And hey, I think the stuff looks darn good out here in the garden. With everything else dying back from the frost, it's great to see this beautiful green foliage in these beds. They'd otherwise be empty. It's just a natural. I'd have to say the single greatest example of a focal point out here would be this great tree. In fact, this tree, we call her the big sister, she actually helped orient and helped design the entire property. It all works around her. When you drive up the driveway, she is front and center. You see there are seven total sisters, but this is the largest of them all. And I think that she's appropriate being the center point for the entire design of the property. She's been dated between three and 350 years old. So the perfect center point for all of this design. In today's show, we've covered lots of examples of focal point here and how you can use them as a design element in your own garden. And I hope they've helped. Until next time, from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at plnsmith.com.